Hello everyone, so I'll be talking about how's your yeast and why you should actually care. My name is Uli Tillich, I'm one of the co-founders and one of the CEOs of Oculize. We founded the company in 2016. My background is in bioinformatics and biotechnology and I did my PhD in molecular biology with a strong focus on laboratory automation. And today we will be talking about yeast. So first off, what is yeast? Uh, then how is it analyzed? And at the end some suggestions on further reading into this topic. So first off, what is actually yeast? Yeast is a member of the fungus family. It is capable of living without oxygen, or as a scientist would say, it's a facultative anaerobe. And if it does not have oxygen, it starts turning sugar into CO2 and alcohol, which most of the time is what we actually wanted to do to, for example, produce delicious beer. And is a, an incredibly well-studied microorganism just because it has been used by humans for such a long time. Now, why is the concentration of yeast or the cell concentration important? If you think about yeast producing alcohol, like I described before, it's like a worker in a factory. So if you compare that to a car, you have all the parts there, and the yeast is the one who actually assembles the car. But if you don't know how many yeasts you have in there and what their health is, uh, you don't really know what the product is going to be at the end. Otherwise, you might end up with a car that looks like this one from this classic uh, Johnny Cash song, One Piece at a Time, where all the parts are there, but it's definitely not assembled properly. Now, in more scientific terms, what does wrong yeast concentration mean? So if you have under attenuation, you can have low alcohol by volume and sweet beer. You can also have plenty of other wanted or unwanted flavors, like a tropical or fruity taste, pumpkin taste, a buttery taste even, which are not in themselves necessarily bad, but they should be there because you want them to and not because you don't have your yeast concentration under control. Finally, a slow fermentation can also lead uh, to tastes you definitely don't want, which is like rotten eggs or like a drain. The efficiency is also affected, obviously. So a quick fermentation means you have quicker turnaround and uh, higher profitability as a brewery. And finally, flavor consistency. You want your batches of the same beer to taste the same. If a customer liked that beer and he comes back a month later, uh, he should get the same product and not something different. Now, why is viability important? So first off, we have to define what viability actually is. Viability means either dead or alive. A viable cell is able to reproduce. So if we're talking about percentage viability, it's a percentage of cells that is able to reproduce. Vitality is something very different. It means how healthy is each individual yeast. So a yeast that is alive could be barely holding on or it could be super fit. And that would be vitality. Vitality itself is very difficult to measure but good for us, it correlates strongly with viability. So if you're thinking about a population, can be humans, can be animals, whatever, where well, half of them are dead, something killed them. And the other half is probably not doing great either. But if everyone is alive, they're probably also happy. Now, how do you measure viability? Uh, typically you use stains. Uh, these stains are like a coloring agent that enters the cell and the ones that are alive are able to metabolize it out. So they turn back transparent and the ones who are dead stay blue, violet, or depending on what, what stain you use, the different color. So there are many stains that can be used. The most common one is methylene blue. Uh, just for historical reasons, it has been the standard stain for a very long time. Um, it is low toxicity. It's, it's not a terrible stain. Its main disadvantage is um, that it's not great at lower viabilities and it's not very binary. So you will get a lot of cells that are like bluish, but not deep blue or transparent. So it makes it even more subjective when analyzing manually. Uh, Trippin blue is, is becoming more popular in, in some regions at least. Um, main disadvantage with it is that it's quite toxic, so it's not as easy to handle. And the one we would most strongly recommend is methylene violet, which uh, is like a modern version of uh, methylene blue if you want. Uh, it works better at lower viabilities, it's also very low toxicity. Uh, and uh, you get a very binary staining, so cells are either colored or not, typically. Now, why is viability important? First off, for all of the reasons I mentioned before about concentration, because if you have a million cells but half of them are dead, you only have half a million cells that are actually doing their job. Additionally, there's some stuff that comes into play only for viability. So you have uh, unwanted flavors like autolysis flavors, which basically means the, the taste of dead cells, uh, which you don't want in your product. And while they are dying, they also produce different alcohols, so fusel alcohols, 
which are known to be strongly correlated with uh, getting a strong hangover from enjoying your drink. So it's also affecting the, the quality of your, your product in a very real way. Um, and stalled fermentations obviously are a huge problem. Um, there's typically not a good way to save a fermentation once it's stalled because your viability dropped so much. Now, uh, the characteristics of a healthy yeast are basically that it has good proliferation, it has strong metabolism, and it has strong cellular uh, integrity of the membrane, so everything you would need. It is, this is especially important if you're repitching. So if you're recycling your yeast, it is essential to check the viability because going through fermentation is a stressful process. And repitching has obvious cost benefits. So we have a table here and we have an online calculator on our website, which you can check out. Uh, but it's also better for your fermentation overall. Yeast that has already gone through a fermentation is better adapted to this medium, this process, and will handle it better. If you're doing high alcohol beers, you should definitely not use fresh yeast. You should be using yeast that you've recycled a couple of times so it can get, get used to this alcoholic environment. Now, how can you analyze yeast? First off, when should you analyze yeast? You should definitely analyze before pitching, so at the beginning of your fermentation. And if you're working with dry yeast, this means after rehydrating uh, it carefully, not immediately after putting it in water. Um, you should also definitely measure after harvesting the yeast when recycling uh, and before repitching. So if there's any time between your harvest and starting your ne next batch, you have to measure again. We actually recommend, uh, not only we, but any brewing book you pick up would recommend to not only check then, but also check during the fermentation. And this is especially important if you're doing, for example, a new brew. Um, which you have not done maybe a couple of hundred times, then you should really ch check how is the yeast behaving over time. So the most common, or at least historical way to analyze yeast is using a hemocytometer. How does a hemocytometer work? We have a very detailed video, which you can find on, on YouTube. Um, and if you're watching this video on YouTube, we will also have the link in the description below, um, where you can see in much detail how the hemocytometer is used from beginning to end. In this presentation, we will focus on the most common sources of error that we've seen actually in practice happening in breweries. So this is the list of the errors and we'll go through one by one. So first off, not taking a representative sample of your yeast. It is very important that the sample you take is actually representing the rest. So let's say you have 20 hectoliters or like 17 barrels if you don't like SE units. Um, and your sample that you're taking is one milliliter. This is like half of a millionth of your actual volume. So if this volume was taken at the very top and the yes, rest of the yeast is settled or at the very bottom when it's settled, it will not represent your tank as a whole. So it's important to either mix it or at least have homogeneous or at least at the very least do it the same way every time so you can compare values. The second error is actually one of the most common ones, which is incorrect dilution uh, or calculating the dilution factor incorrectly. So dilution itself is uh, technically very simple. Uh, you just take your sample and dilute it in water. But errors can and do happen here. So uh, you should watch out and write down all of your steps so you can trace your errors afterwards. Also, you should be diluting with buffer or with water, like regular tap water, not with deionized water. Deionized water puts osmotic stress on the cells and can affect the viability measurement quite a bit. Uh, sadly, we see this quite often. The dilution factor is also fairly simple to calculate. We'll go into the formula later, but errors do happen here as well, so watch out. And it's important to note um, that almost any system you use for counting, I mean, we're talking about manual counting here now, but automated counting as well, you will have to dilute yourself. So any mistake you make here, automation is not really going to save you. Um, and finally, do not dilute too much just to have an easier count. So this is something we've seen quite a bit as well, where people dilute maybe by a factor 10 more than they should, just so it's quick to count because you only have five cells in your counting grid. So definitely don't do that. Just dilute so you have a reasonable number of cells uh, in your counting chamber. We also have a video specific uh, about dilution, which you can watch on that link, or we have it in the description down below if you're watching on YouTube. It's for our device, but these rules generally apply for all manners of um, yeast counting. Now, overloading the chamber, this is 
probably the second most common mistake that we see, that the Thoma chamber or Neubauer chamber is not prepared uh, properly. When you're putting the cover slip on it, it should be held on uh, by, by capillary force. Um, and the way to check that this is properly done uh, is you will see these uh, Newton rings, which are basically interference patterns by the two glass parts uh, sticking together. This is also explained in more detail in our other video, but just make sure you see these rings and load the sample from the side carefully with a pipette and let the capillary force suck your yeast solution under um, in, into the chamber volume and don't put the solution and then press the cover slip on top because you will not have a defined volume and you will not have an accurate count. So one of the other mistakes you can make is actually not following the counting rules correctly. So here we have all of the rules. I'm not going to go into detail into all of them. You can pause the video and look at them or check out the longer video we have on uh, using a hemocytometer. Um, the most important ones where often mistakes happen is uh, budding cells. Uh, so it's very important um, that budding cells are only counted towards concentration if the bud is 50% or larger than the mother cell, uh, otherwise they're excluded. And that also plays into viability. So I, I explained the general rules about viability before, um, but budding comes into it because budding cells are very often stained, even though they are probably alive. I mean, they're reproducing at the moment. They're the very definition of viable. Um, so the, what you do is you should exclude them from viability analysis if they're stained and not count them as dead, even if they are stained. And uh, then calculation mistakes. So if you take the very basic formula for how to calculate your concentration in a hemocytometer, it's fairly simple. You have the cells you counted divided by the volume that you counted them in, uh, and then you add a dilution factor if you dilute it. So not complex here, but errors can happen. Um, especially since there are hemocytometers with different areas uh, and you also have to correct for how many squares you counted because almost no one will count the entire area of a hemocytometer and as I mentioned before actually use the correct dilution factor. So now we'll do an example uh, just to show how counting and calculation works and, and where, uh, where errors can happen. So these are the assumptions. Your Toma chamber or a hemocytometer has a length and width of one millimeter and a height of 0.1 millimeters and you dilute it with one part yeast and 99 parts water and you will only count two squares of the 25 in your counting area which is actually too little but we'll do it for this example you should be counting at least five if not more now i will not go into each detail of the breakdown but you can pause the video and, and look look into it it's not that complicated but you can see that there are quite a few sources of error what we end up with in this case is that whatever you counted in these two squares, you should multiply by 12 and a half million uh, to get your concentration in cells per milliliter. And so here's an example uh, of uh, a grid with cells that you should be counting based upon the rules that were shown a slide before and that you're probably familiar with. Um, if you're walking along, which I strongly suggest, please just pause the video, take your time, count these cells and then we can compare what you can come up with. So if you count it correctly, uh, you should get 52 cells in the one image and 56 uh, cells in the other image. If you add that up, you get 108. And if you multiply that by uh, the 12 and a half million, you get to 141 billion cells or 1,417 million cells per milliliter. And if some of you watching this now say, well, I counted correctly, but I got different numbers. Uh, here is the reference. Uh, everything that's crossed out with an X are cells you should not have uh, counted because they're either touching an edge or they're too small as budding cells. And also remember that this example we just did is without viability. So if you add viability to this, uh, there's quite a few more sources of error that you can uh, fall into. And some additional final general tips. So get a clicker if you're counting manually. Even better, get at least two clickers if you're doing viability as well to not get mixed up. Um, if you're using a hemocytometer, count both sides. So there's two sides of the chamber. Do one side first, then fill the other and count that one as well. And the uh, results should be fairly similar to make sure you didn't make a mistake. 
um, and very important to have the same person do the count every time. I know this is not easy in practice every time, but there's quite a bit of subjectivity, especially when it comes to like budding cells and viability. Is, is it blue? Is it not blue? Is it 50% of the area or is it larger? Uh, humans are not great at estimating the area of circles. So if, if one person uh, does it all the time, he might make mistakes, but he'll probably tend to make mistakes in the same spots. So at least it's uh, consistent. Um, and finally, create like a standard document where you just fill in the data that will uh, alleviate the, the pressure of like filling in the steps you did for the dilution if everything is pre-written and you only put down the numbers. Like print a stack of them and keep them in the lab. Now uh, we'll come to our own product, which is the Oculus BB2. So this is what it looks like. Basically, it's a mobile microscope uh, that you use with a smartphone. And the way it works is you open our app, um, then you connect our smartphone, you take images, they're sent to the cloud, processed with image recognition, and then you get the results back. Or if we go step by step, so first you focus the sample uh, using a wheel, then you get the image, and each image you take is like one of the squares on the hemocytometer, and you can take quite a few if you want, up to 20, default is five, like with the hemocytometer. After you're done uh, with your images, they're sent to the server, and then it's processed in the cloud, and within a couple of seconds, you will get the results back on the device. And the results typically look like this. So in this case, it would be like 5.9 million cells per milliliter and a high viability of 98.5%, which is also done in a single step. So there's no reason not to do viability because it's easy to do. Um, you can also check on your images so you can validate uh, that it counted correctly if you don't trust our device yet. You will get a histogram of the sizes as well, which is something you can't do manually. Here are some examples of images. So this one is stained with methyl and violet, and the other one is stained with methyl and blue. Uh, and here's an example of a rather challenging uh, image with methyl and blue, where you see it's uh, quite dirty. Um, so we can measure in worth, and you will get accurate results even if you have other particles floating around, as long as it doesn't, as long as it does not look identical to a yeast our algorithms will not count it. Finally, you also have um, a history, so like a lab book, so there's no need to like copy out the results uh, that you made with our device. And you can also use uh, the app itself to calculate your uh, next pitch. So you can put in your, your volume, your pitching rate, uh, and it will give you what volume of the yeast do I have to take and put into uh, my fermenter to start. Uh, you also have a web app. So you don't have to limit yourself to accessing the results on the smartphone app or tablet app. You can also log in with any web browser uh, capable device into a web app and check your results there. Finally, you have to clean the chamber, which is also easier than with the Toma chamber. Basically, you put uh, distilled water through it with a um, syringe. And if you want to reuse it right away, you can also dry it with some bellows so the chamber is reusable. As an alternative, you can also use uh, an add-on for a laboratory microscope, so you can retro retrofit the microscope you might already have. Um, this is especially interesting, for example, for larger breweries who have a very set-in-stone process and they want to change their process as little as possible. Uh, in general, I would say our microscope is easier to use, but it's totally up to you if you have a microscope and you like your microscope and you like loading the Toma chamber, because with this you're still using the Toma chamber. Uh, you can use this system as well. Our device has been very thoroughly tested. So three years ago when we were starting, we had a, an external validation done by the VLB, so the Brewery Institute here in Berlin, which is internationally renowned, and they showed that we are as accurate as someone with 20 years experience in the lab um, and more accurate than the automated uh, desktop cell counter they compared us with. We have hundreds of customers worldwide in uh, like 40 countries, here are just uh, some, some examples. Now an overview about what else is there on the market aside from the hemocytometer uh, and our own device. So cell counters that are capable of counting yeast have been around for a long time. So we did a little bit of a timeline here and also put the phone next to it that came out the same year, just so you get an idea of <laughs> the ages we're talking about. Um, so it goes from very old to relatively modern ones like the Avacountstar, for example. Uh, in our view, the problem that all of these cell counters share is that their desktop software 
um, which means they barely or they get rare, if at all, any updates. So it's more like an operating system than a, a modern web app or anything you're used to. So more Windows than Gmail, let's put it like that. Um, and we do know of at least one manufacturer where they did a big update and all they changed was the graphical interface and the algorithms that count, which were not great, uh, stayed the same. Of these many um, yeast counters that are on the market, very few actually specifically target breweries like we do. And that's not because our competition is lazy, it's just because the way their business model is set up, it's very hard for them to do custom solutions, um, which is easier with the way we do it with cloud computing. So that's really our secret sauce. It's not the mobile microscope. I mean, I mentioned before, you're free to use your own. It's the software that is analyzing the yeast for you. And since it's cloud-based software, it means it's staying up to date all of the time uh, and improving all of the time without extra charges uh, to you. Um, you can check with our customers who've been with us for a long time how much uh, the product has Im improved in the time and also based upon their feedback. Now if we do an overview about the technologies uh, in general, we have the microscope, other cell counters and the Oculus BB2 for us. All of them can do concentration, all of them can do viability. I mean there are some cell counters that can't do viability but you really shouldn't be using such old technology. Contamination uh, you can see it on our microscope. You can also see it in the BB2 because it's also a microscope. Uh, but it's in parentheses because you shouldn't be using a microscope, any microscope, to look for contamination. When you see it on a microscope, it's probably too late to do anything about it. Uh, human error is um, present in the microscope and far less so in the automated systems. Uh, ours is the only one that uses a mobile device, uh, which in practice for smaller breweries means uh, you can put it in a cupboard and take it out when you need it. It does not need its dedicated space. We are the only ones that do automated documentation with the history and all of the tracking uh, of your own data uh, that you have. And because of that, we're also the fastest because documentation also takes quite a bit of time. And if you don't think so, uh, try and time yourself while you do it. Uh, we're also uh, very affordable on the hardware side, so the most you can pay for our microscope, if you need it, is uh, $999. Um, many of our customers get it for free uh, if they buy a flat rate for a year, for example. Uh, we also have uh, the ability to do budding cell counts, which very few other cell counters do, and as I mentioned before, it's actually essential to get viability right as well. Uh, we have a, a full list of our competitors, like an analysis, uh, that you can request uh, by going to this link also again in the description of the video. Here it's just in chart form so um, the most expensive thing you can do is actually use a microscope at least if you value your time at all. If you don't then it's probably the cheapest. Uh, finally some suggestions upon further reading I mean this is just an expert uh, you can go deep into the rabbit hole of all the ins and outs of yeast counting um, so there's quite a few good presentations here. I'm not going to read them all out. Uh, the one I would probably most strongly suggest, aside from our own training material, of course, uh, is the book Yeast, uh, The Practical Guide to Beer Fermentation by Chris White. Uh, you can probably get it on any retail uh, online bookstore, which I'm not going to name. So, yeah, that's it. And thank you very much for your attention.